wait just a second for everybody to join, but I know some of you are coming in now. So good morning to everybody. As luck would have it, I have some construction outside of my window here. I hope it's not too noisy for anybody. Thank you for being here. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to South Florida Trade Connections. Um, we had hoped to have this event in person. That was the plan until about three weeks ago. And then uh, the Delta variant uh, reared itself up and we felt it was prudent uh, or wise that uh, for our sake and for yours that we do this as a, another webinar. But we're glad you're here and we think you'll find it to be uh, a worthwhile experience. Um, many of you know me. Um, but in case you don't, my name is Ken Roberts. I'm the president of World City. Uh, five times a month, I write a column for Forbes.com on international trade. I've been doing that for three or four years. I served six years, two, three-year terms on the Federal Reserve Trade and Transportation Advisory Board. It was a great experience. Uh, we analyze trade data is what we do. We've published annual trade numbers publications for more than 22 dozen markets around the country over the years, the last 20 years. And uh, we also analyze trade data at our website, USTradeNumbers.com, and I'll be showing you that in a bit. We do a trade talk newsletter for um, communities around the country, including here in South Florida. We'll have one coming out in the next uh, two to three days on South Florida that will sort of pick up where we leave off here and add some additional value for you on some additional detail and so forth. Uh, we do trade matters videos. Um, and I speak at events like this uh, both here, obviously, uh, sometimes in person, sometimes via webinar. We'll be doing one in Texas, hopefully in person, we'll see uh, next month. And we've got one in for uh, Los Angeles. Uh, LAX uh, next month also that will be a webinar. Uh, we cannot do what we do without the support of MIA, My International Airport. Um, they support not only this event, but they support our Trade Matters videos, they support our Trade Talk newsletter, and as you'll see in just a moment, they uh, uh, open their page on our website uh, to you and everybody else who would like to keep up with that data. Um, we also want to thank uh, our supporting sponsors, the World Trade Center in Miami, and the Florida Custom Brokers and Ford Association, two very important communities, two very important longstanding uh, organizations in this community. Um, I should mention that um, the uh, 24th annual America Food and Beverage Show is coming up in early November. The original intent there was to have it in person, but uh, I believe they've also switched to a, uh, a, a webinar sort of format, and that's in November. I would urge you uh, to show your support for that very important organization by registering. And uh, you can go to AmericanFoodAndBeverage.com and uh, Tatiana will put that in the chat uh, for you so you can see it there. Tatiana Panzardi is uh, sort of the uh, uh, director of events at World City and one of the things she does is keeps uh, the, the trains running on time, if you will. And uh, so she'll be putting things in chat, uh, the chat if you want. Uh, we have two great speakers today um, to talk about uh, ocean and air trade. Uh, Leandro Moreira is with Your Way. And Joe Rodriguez is with Sealand. I'll be giving you more details about them a little bit later in the event, but uh, they'll be coming on to talk specifically about things within their particular area of expertise. Um, if any point during the uh, webinar today you have questions, um, all you have to do is go into the Q&A uh, little tab on your screen there and answer that question. And either I will uh, uh, see that question or Tatiana will see that question and get it to my attention. We'll try to answer it as best we can, as quickly as we can. As I mentioned, we have updated data on our website. It's updated every month for every airport, seaport, and water crossing in the country, updated for more than 200 countries, and updated for um, uh, roughly 1,800 different um, uh, export and import commodities. Here's the MIA page, MIA page, my international airport page. And at the top, this is our dashboard section, and this is what you'll see for all the, all the pages if they're not, if they're not uh, sponsored, as this one is by MIA. Uh, you can subscribe to any one of these pages for 125 bucks a year, so it's not a lot of money. But here it'll show you the compare the total trade exports and imports to the previous month and the same month last year. Uh, if, if the page is open or if you're a subscriber, this MIS page, it'll give you an enormous amount of detail about top trade partners. You can look at value tonnage, uh, year to date, current month, last annual exports, imports. Uh, it'll show you the, it'll show you how the a particular port uh, rank. So if you want to switch in this case, just to airport to see MIA compared to other airports, it'll show you that as well. Um, so, you know, really uh, a great deal of detail. Um, the, the relationship between the exports and imports, you can see in that pie chart. 
month over month trade for the last year. And there's always a story that will give you a, a great deal more information uh, for you to look at there. Um, so we're going to we're going to be looking today at the first six months of the year. And that's the latest data available by uh, U.S. Census. OK. And before we do that, we're going to launch uh, some poll questions for you. And I've got one for each of the three ports. And I'm going to admit today I made them a little bit harder than I normally do. And that's only to um, that's only to um, um, uh, because because of the interesting points they make. Um, let me see what's. Let me get this first question up here for you. Okay. Why am I in this screen? Huh? I've got a little glitch here that I can't figure out with the poll question. Um, give me one second for the technical difficulty part of this. So I can take it from here, Ken, for the poll. I won't, uh, oh, relaunch poll, there it is, I can do it. There you go, relaunch, okay. So here we go. First question's up on the screen for you. Uh, and these are anonymous, so don't worry about us calling anybody out on their answer. Comparing MIA trade for the first six months of this year, the same period last year during the pandemic, and then during 2019 pre-pandemic, which of these answers best uh, represents the change in export tonnage value? Export tonnage value. Um, up 15% from 2020 and flat from 2019, up 30% from 2020 and down 5% from 2019, or up 40% from 2020 and up 20% from 2019. So I'll give you guys just a few seconds. And again, these are uh, intentionally today, I made them a little difficult because the story behind the answers are, are, are kind of interesting. And there'll be one for each of the three boards. I'll give you guys about 10 more seconds uh, to take a crack at this. Now I'll, I'll uh, show the answers. Uh, I'll show the answers to your the survey and then I'll show the correct answer during the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results with you. And uh, a little bit over half of you think that uh, it's up 40% from 2020, about 20% from 2019, uh, about 20%, I uh, think it's the second answer and about 25, the first answer. So uh, half of you are at the, the, with the, with the big numbers. Okay, let's go to the second question here. This one will be for Port Miami. And Port Miami tonnage exports. Port Miami's leading export by tonnage this year is scrap iron and steel. Three fourths of goes to just three countries. Which one of these three countries is not in the top three? Pakistan, China, Taiwan, or Bangladesh? And again, I tried to make these questions a little difficult today the answer surprised me to be honest i've been looking at data like this for two decades usually i make them a little more intuitive if you follow trade you can figure that out and figure out the answers and i'll give you guys about 10 more seconds on this one and again the answers are anonymous we don't know what you put we will not be broadcasting your test scores on facebook <laughs> Okay, so I, I think I did pretty well here and getting a pretty good balance in the answers here. So 32% said Pakistan and Taiwan, and then 21% uh, said, said China, and 16% said Bangladesh. Okay, and again, I'll get to this answer in just a moment as we go through the presentation. Okay, so Here's the question for Port Everglades Tonnage Imports. This con the construction boom has led this country to becoming Port Everglades top trade import partner by tonnage. What country is it? The construction boom. And, um, I think what, what we'll see in the data when I show it to you is just the, the impact of COVID in so many areas of our lives, obviously, but also in the import and export uh, trade and the country trade that we're seeing at our seaports. Getting a little faster to answer this question. I guess there's fewer, fewer opportunities on this particular. 
Give me about five or 10 more seconds here and we'll share the results. Okay, so here's what you think. You two thirds of you think uh, Turkey, um, one third more or less think China, and the uh, trade commissioner from Iceland was not here today, unfortunately, and did not cast that vote for Iceland. So Iceland got no votes today. Um, and again, we'll get to those answers in uh, just a moment for all those questions. So let's now look at some of these uh, statistics here. And um, so let me explain what you're looking at here. This V shape. Is, shows the pandemic sort of graphically. You see Miami International Port Everglades and Port Miami there, and you can see they all took that, that dip in, through the first six months of 2020 compared to 19. And then you can see in 2021, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see those, those percentages going back up, okay? So MIA's up, uh, Port Miami's up, and Port Everglades is, is almost up to the 2019 level, just slightly down from that. Um, and again, this is uh, by, by value, okay? Now, if we switch to tonnage, make sure I show you the right one. Here's tonnage. It's the opposite, okay? It's a V this way. What does that tell you? It tells you that heavy things are being moved rather than valuable things. What does that suggest? It suggests the impact of the coronavirus because there was so much money put into the US economy by the Congress and the Federal Reserve to keep the United States economy from you know, suffering a tremendous fall as it did in the uh, global economic crisis a decade earlier from the mortgage crisis, uh, that suddenly people had made changes in their lives. They were, many of us were sent home to work uh, and decided we looked around our house and the things we wanted to do. Uh, many of us were sent home to eat. We couldn't go to restaurants and hotels like we could and we decided to change how we ate. So there were all sorts of changes uh, that that happened there. So now um, let me go to the next one and we'll look at uh, the total tonnage. Um, did I skip somebody here? Let's, no, that's right. So this is three ports by exports. And again, you see the by value, this is the V. But now if we go to exports by tonnage, again, it's this way. Now here's the answer to that first poll question on MIA. Look at that increase. Um, of 42%, 42% and then compared to 2019, it's just under 20%. And the question, I rounded those numbers off a bit. So what's going on there? Well, so I was sort of curious, um, what on earth was leading to a big increase in exports from MIA, a very big increase. And um, I found it was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll save it till we get to the uh, point in the, uh, in the demonstration where we see it. I'll, I'll tell you in just a minute. But if we go to imports again, same V this way. I don't want to spend too much time on these. And this way. And by the way, the, the dotted lines represent all seaports and all airports. The dotted gray line is all airports. The dotted green line is all seaports. And as you can see, the, the seaports basically outperformed um, uh, Port Miami and Port Everglades outperformed all seaports, generally speaking. Uh, Port Miami, uh, generally speaking, is doing better than or equal to um, all airports, a little bit down on uh, the one year change. So now let's look at MIA. So this is two, two tree maps they're called. And what they do is they represent 100% of the trade each of these tree maps does by country. Okay, and the top one is value and the bottom one is tonnage. And what you'll notice is um, the big difference. So airports and seaports derive their revenues by the weight of whatever is being imported or exported. So that's what they pay the most attention to. They pay attention to tonnage. They also pay attention to particular seaports, TEUs. Um, the value is helpful also because it tells you um, we, have, we have a trade deficit surplus and, and people can obviously just understand value more easily. Uh, dollars are more easy for a lot of people to understand. But the big difference there you see is uh, on the tonnage side, uh, just two countries, Colombia and Chile, account for 48% of all tonnage through uh, MIA on the, uh, as, as trade partners. Let's look now at uh, the exports from MIA. And um, here you'll see civilian aircrafts and parts, cell phones, computers, uh, plasma va vaccines and blood fractions, computer ships, very high value things on the value side, right? 
And Leandro is going to talk a good bit about this, ca this category of blood uh, vaccines and blood fractions. Uh, blood fractions, by the way, are not as glorious as they might sound as white blood cells and things like that um, that are very critical in the, uh, the healthcare industry. But if you flip down to the bottom, my international exports, number one is this category, high parts for heavy machinery, followed by motor vehicle parts, cell phones, computers, and transmission shafts and bearings and gears. So that's the one that sort of uh, caught my attention is parts for heavy machinery. So, so what I did is I went in and tried to figure out what that was. And I found out that it was basically derricks and uh, things like that, parts for derricks. And uh, this is again from our website. Uh, if you go into this level and you can look at the exports of my, by country and you can see what, uh, or by category, this is parts for heavy machinery exports and 80% uh, going to Chile by tonnage. Now I was curious, is that sort of a longstanding thing? So I switched back to 2020 and you see it was still important. You know, it was a third of the value uh, or a third of the tonnage that was sent out from MIA last year by clicking on 2020. But for the year to date, it was up to 79%. For the year, up to 84%. So there's a, a, some, some significant investment happening uh, there that is, uh, has changed uh, MIA's export picture uh, for the better. Okay, so, um, so that's what that will show you. If we go now to the imports, here's where, if you remember on the tonnage side, when we're looking at the countries, you saw Colombia and Chile as the top ones. Well, on the value side, you see gold. And I'll talk about gold in, in just a minute, but gold is the number one uh, import by value. It tends to come from uh, uh, South America into uh, MIA. Uh, then you got computer chips. I'll skip over returned exports without change for now, but cell phones related equipment. Then you see your, your uh, fish fillets and your fresh cut flowers and uh, paintings, artwork and so forth. But now look down at the tonnage and here's where you see fresh cut flowers and the fish. Um, they alone account for uh, just the first two account for 59% uh, uh, and you throw in the, the, the whole fish basically, uh, fresher told you're at almost two thirds of the total tonnage coming into MIA, MIA this year, those three categories. And those are gonna involve largely Colombia on the flowers, and largely Chile on the, the fish, um, salmon largely on the, on the fish. And again, this ties into the pandemic. We went home and we decided we wanted to eat healthier. I'm sure it may be you or maybe somebody you know you know people who have lost weight and gotten in better shape during the pandemic. I would like to say I'm one of those people, but unfortunately I am one of those people who found a few extra pounds during the pandemic, uh, unfortunately. But uh, fresh cut flowers, I can't quite answer that one. If there's someone here representing the flower industry knows, but I don't know if we became more romantic uh, while we were all stuck at home or, or not. But for some reason, fresh cut flowers, those are largely roses coming from, uh, from Colombia, as I mentioned. Uh, those uh, have done very well as well. So now we're going to switch over to uh, Port Miami. Uh, so here's Port Miami's trade by value and tonnage. And what uh, I should mention about Port Miami's trade, um, both by value and tonnage, China is the largest trade partner. But because in the census data, the Miami River data gets uh, pushed in with Port Miami, and a lot of that trade goes to the DR, sometimes it, it, it sort of skews that total a little bit. But what you see on the tonnage side on the bottom, um, uh, what you see on the bottom is that Turkey pops in as number three, which is kind of uh, an interesting one, and we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Um, let's now look at the exports. Um, passenger vehicles has become a big export out of uh, Port Miami by value. Uh, then you see cotton yarns, computers, motor vehicle parts, um, so forth. Uh, if you look on the bottom, by, by tonnage, the number one export out of Port Miami is uh, scrap iron and steel. So now it's time to answer our last question. And let's go to share that screen for you quickly and get to the right answer for you. So here's scrap iron and steel and um, Taiwan, Pakistan, Bangladesh are the big three. And uh, that surprised me because we always hear so much about China. Well, here's, here's uh, China. Uh, down at uh, less than 1%. Now, I don't know what Taiwan is doing with all that scrap iron and steel. I know it's very close to China. I know that, but um, I thought that was an interesting uh, 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 result as well. And that's why I had that question as one of them to answer. So that again is the uh, exports um, from Port Miami.
And here's the imports. And here again, you'll see the, the, the impact of uh, on the tonnage side of the coronavirus and what we did. So on the top, you see some of the apparel, you see uh, sweaters, you see t-shirts, you also see cigars and cigarettes. Am I, uh, Port Miami is a very big importer in that space. Uh, by the way, the fourth one there, heterocyclic compounds, uh, those are tied in again to the farm industry, which Andrew will talk about uh, shortly when we get to that. On the, on the tonnage side, you see granite, marble, uh, other stones, you see uh, unglazed ceramic flags, uh, paving hearth tiles, uh, melons and papayas uh, doing very well this year, uh, big increases there. Uh, you see furniture. I don't know how many of you have tried to get furniture during the pandemic and been frustrated and think, oh, it's a, it's a supply side problem, it's a logistics problem. Actually, uh, to some extent, it is not. It's a demand issue. Um, the, the imports of furniture into many of our airports and seaports is actually, in, or many of our seaports, I should say, has actually increased. It's a demand. It's a demand issue. And again, that goes to all the money that's in the economy, and people are fixing up their houses. Uh, they need more computers for their home office. They need, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's, we'll jump to Port Everglades, um, and there you see um, on the bottom of your screen, you see a top trade partner by tonnage, and uh, that was the answer to the third question: is Turkey. Okay. But on the top, you see Dominican Republic, Honduras, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Colombia. You see a lot of the, what you would expect, some of the usual suspects, right? That would be the top trade partners for whatever it is. But in comes Turkey uh, there at number one by tonnage through the first six months of the year. And again, that's gonna be largely um, uh, um, products related to construction. So it's gonna be cement, it's gonna be tiles, it's gonna be those kind of things. Uh, on the export side, uh, uh, just like MIA, top uh, export is passenger vehicles. Then you see cotton yarn, which is going to be yarn that's going to largely go to Central America and come back as apparel. You see computers, motor vehicle parts, motorboats and yachts. Again, high value items. You jump down to tonnage, uh, you're going to see cotton and yarn. And I realize some of you cannot read some of these, depending on the size screen you're on. So that's why I'm sort of reading them out loud. Cotton yarn, chicken and other uh, poultry, passenger vehicles, uh, gasoline, synthetic yarn, uh, and uh, so forth are, are those. And then if we go lastly to the import section, uh, gasoline is a uh, gasoline and jet fuel and other uh, refined petroleum products, an extremely important part of what Port, Port Everglades does for basically uh, from Orlando down, but, but, in, but in, uh, absolutely for South Florida. A lot of a good deal of the gasoline and jet fuel that is used, <coughs> excuse me, here in South Florida comes through Port Everglades. Uh, what has happened over the years, and one of the reasons that Port Everglades um, has, has a hard time breaking records for the value of its trade and for the tonnage of its trade is that the hydraulic fraction industry has grown up and there's been a large domestic supply uh, of gasoline. But what you can also see on the tonnage side, you can see the number two. Uh, import by tonnage is uh, cement. Uh, melons and papayas, again, doing very well at uh, Port Everglades. By the way, I should mention those in, in this case uh, is largely, uh, uh, oh, geez, the, the tropical fruit, uh, guava, excuse me, I almost, almost lost there. Guava is in this category and that's uh, a very high ranking. You've got uh, bananas and plantains uh, and so forth. So- Ken, you have a question in the chat, in the Q&A. Well, that's good because this is the question time of the conversation. So let's see what that question is. Um, hi, Ken, thanks for sharing this uh, very valuable information. Can we get a copy of this presentation? So this presentation uh, absolutely will be up on uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel, usually today sometime, uh, probably within a couple hours after the presentation. And Tatiana will send an email uh, to all of you saying where that link is. And I realized in particular with this one where I went through pretty quickly, I, I realized we might want to go back and look at some of, some of the data points and so forth. So hope that answers your question, Maria. Any other questions about any of that data? If not, we'll go to the next section of our presentation and that's where I uh, introduce our first uh, speaker who is uh, Joe Rodriguez. Um, and Joe is, uh, uh, Joe is, whoops, let's, let's go back to this one slide here. I'm going to read his bio. I jumped the gun on myself. 
So Joe is the managed director for North America and Canada for Sealand. He's been, a, he's been in the logistics field since 1999, so from the last century. Uh, and World City was started in 1998, by the way. Uh, he has held roles in multiple supply chain segments, including LTL, perishables, pharmaceuticals, NBOCC, and automotive. His current role includes, includes leading commercial strategy and execution for North America with Latin American and Caribbean as his territories. And with that said, we'll bring Joe on screen. And again, I, I remind you that at any point you have uh, questions for either me or Joe, that you should just jump right in and ask those questions. And while we wait for Joe to join us, let me just real quickly uh, to make one point that I didn't make yet. And that's on what happens from here, uh, what kind of year we're gonna end up with for the three ports. And I'll tell you quickly, and again, the Trade Talk newsletter that is going out in a couple of days will have more detail on this. Port Miami will set a record for value and tonnage, uh, breaking marks it set in 2019. Port Miami will break uh, the record for tonnage, but not for value. And the reason it won't break it for value is because of all that gold trade that was occurring back in uh, roughly a decade ago, but in 2012, and the value of gold imports and exports have slowed somewhat in Miami just because there's been less demand for that gold. And so these are, these are things that are somewhat out of anybody's control. And Port Everglades will not break records for either. Um, and that's because, again, of that gasoline situation with gasoline and jet fuel. So the pandemic hurt the consumption of gasoline and uh, uh, jet fuel. But even still, overall demand, even if it gets back to normal levels, a lot of that demand can be met by domestic sources now. So, uh, uh, Joe, welcome to the webinar. I'm glad you're here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ken. Thank so, you, World City and, and the trade community for all uh, being here virtually. I would have loved to have done this live as we had originally right. set out to do, but given the circumstances, this is the next best thing. So, yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's a shame. So what I thought I would start with, Joe, is just um, bring us up to date on Sealand. Sealand, as most of you know, is part of MERSC. But why don't you bring us up to date on what's going on within the company so they have a sense of the, the bigger picture. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Um, the, the biggest thing that's going on within Sealand, a MERS company, as, as you stated earlier, is our continued plight to become the global integrator in logistics. Um, what this means for us and, and all the brands under the Maersk umbrella, which includes Hamburg Sud, it includes Maersk, it includes Sealand, is that we are um, focusing on becoming a end-to-end -end provider of goods, of services for our customers, becoming more integrated with them. Since we last spoke with you, uh, I think a few years ago, we've had several acquisitions to help us move into this field. Um, we have brought on board Performance Team, which is a major player in the warehouse and distribution space throughout North America. Uh, combined now with Maersk, it brings in North America uh, our total warehouse footprint to over 46 sites and 9 million square feet. And this helps us in the fulfillment area of the logistics field. Uh, we have a facility in Miami um, that is located uh, very close to both the Port of Miami and Port Everglades and um, is helping us grow in, in that space as we see the logistics um, industry continue to change as more e-commerce becomes the, the name of the game versus the traditional um, brick and mortar models that we were familiar with in the past. Sure. So we are uh, very focused on that. We, we've been growing uh, our technology and the innovation that our company has invested in is, is something that's uh, helping us keep pace with the speed of business right now. And um, like you, you asked me earlier, the Sealand portion of it is focused. We have three Sealand brands in, in the globe one in Europe, one in Asia, and one here in the Americas. And we in the Americas focus on the trades that are in this hemisphere. So anything that moves north and south throughout the Americas is our focus area. Um, and then we have the added uh, assistance of, of our parent company, Maersk, that brings in equipment 
full and empties from around the globe, east and west, which helps us uh, fulfill customer supply chain needs throughout this hemisphere. Great. So, speak, so let's talk about, um, obviously the pandemic changed a lot of things about the way business is done um, in all sorts of areas. Quick question then, um, what kind of product changes did you see with the products you are moving changing at all? Because we all, we all remember the toilet paper problem that began the pandemic. We've heard about lumber, we've heard about you know, the shortage of this and so forth. So what did you guys see in the product mix? Great question, Ken, great question. And I, I think you, you've touched on it a couple of times uh, about the consumer demand and what's going on in, in consumer spending. So that, that really drives the, the changes um, of where people are spending their disposable income. Uh, a, big, a big one is definitely building materials. So you're looking at the lumber, the tile, the glass, all of that has been in huge demand. Um, I think everyone on this call probably knows that the home improvement industry is doing better than ever. Um, and almost anyone you talk to is doing something on their home. So that's going to drive the cement track outside my house. I don't know if you guys are hearing this, but it keeps going by. Can you keep it down? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's a great time to be a tradesman for sure. Um, the, the, the prices are high on everything uh, that's coming in because the demand it has peaked. We also see a, a lot, and, and we, we are heavy in the perishables and the frozen, uh, on specifically the refrigerated markets. We've seen that boom as well. Um, as you said, people are eating uh, uh, healthier and, and things like that, but they're eating at home more. They're, they're buying from the grocery stores. You see that happening more. Obviously, the restaurant business has been impacted, seems to have had a comeback now. And then at least here in Florida, we're starting to see measures being taken, wearing masks and people feeling uh, they need to be extra careful I know in, in, in my immediate uh, circle of family, yeah. everyone is going out less immediately just to be safer. Yeah. So that drives that that drives a lot of, of what we're bringing into uh, South Florida specifically. Did you um, mention uh, Did you mention paper and paperboard? Did you mention that as one of them? I told you that yes when, when we spoke earlier. I mean, yeah. as you know, everyone is ordering at their home. And this is causing the packaging business to, to boom. Yep. Uh, there's more boxes that are being shipped around. There's more plastic being shipped around. So these um, packaging materials, which are a paper or resin, have also been in high demand. And we've seen a peak on that volume as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We got a couple of questions, but let me ask you one more. Uh, here, I'll ask the first one from uh, Jose Suarez. Uh, hi, Joe. Have you seen a growing trend or request for a more robust and complete open visibility network for tracking shipments from origin, origin, origin to destination? Absolutely, Jose. Um, that's a, a growing trend. Uh, more and more people are doing what we're doing. They're managing their business remotely. They're managing it from their homes. So they need more visibility throughout their supply chain in order to have these tools at, at their hands. Um, many of it, they want it on mobile devices, on multiple devices. So it is putting pressure on the IT infrastructure of many companies, ours included. And uh, it's, it's something that you have to keep pace with and, and up, be able to provide it on so many multiple um, devices. So it, it, it's different to, to, to provide it on, I'm sure most people know, on an Apple versus an Android versus a, a Microsoft. There's just so many different ways to get it to customers and the customers want choices. Right, right. And I'll, this one is directed at me, but I'll let you jump in and maybe even Leandro when he comes on. But it's, uh, I can't wait to see you today from uh, Jesus Lebo, uh, Lebo, Lobo. Um, given the significant growth in tonnage for South Florida ports, air and ocean, uh, do you have any insight on investments the carriers and port authorities are making to increase capacity to support the growth? Um, and I will say quickly that the seaports here and around the country largely have done a great deal of that in, in investment on the, on the port side um, due to the Panama Canal expansion. So a lot of some of that expansion was already underway, but do you have anything to add in terms of what uh, carriers are doing? I think 
I think carriers are still making bigger ships, aren't they? There, there, there are some carriers that are pursuing more tonnage in, in uh, to, to replace um, tonnage mainly. So the tonnage hasn't been the big, at least for us, we haven't seen that tonnage has been the issue. The issue has been more that the cargo has was delayed, let's say, and that created a domino effect yep. that is very difficult to flush out with the existing tonnage. Right. To bring in additional tonnage to to make that we we do that we 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 bring in some additional vessels where we get a lot of congestion, but the catch up is something that will take time, not investment at, at this point, because then we'll, we'll be back in a situation where we'll have too much tonnage when things normalize. That's what, what I believe. Yeah, one more uh, question that I'm going to ask you, and there's an expression in the legal profession, and I'm not a lawyer, but there's probably some on the call. Don't ask a question if you don't know the answer already, but I'm going to take a chance on this one. Are there any uh, ports that are uh, handling the, the flow of goods through their ports better than others? I know like LA Long Beach, you hear about the tremendous number of ships just parking out in the, in the uh, ocean there. Um, are there some ports that are doing, uh, how are we doing here in South Florida? Are there other ports? Because you guys are, Marist is pretty much everywhere. Yes, um, that's, that's true, Ken. And I, I I would say that the, the ports aren't not handling it better than one or another. All the ports are very competitive. They're, they're, they're a great group of professionals and the people there. Where you get into issues or what we've seen has been on the labor side. So wherever the pandemic or wherever yeah. these uh, cases arise, um, it causes a strain. And then if you have a backlog of, of cargo, it's going to be difficult to get out of there. Um, in the West Coast, we experienced yep. that both on crews, on the crew on the vessel, as well as um, the staff that we have on the port side and the trucking side as well. So it, 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 again, it's a domino effect and, and it takes time to, to deplete. But South Florida, uh, you know, speaking to the community here has managed very well. Um, they had a, a period of, of time, or at least we did, where the volumes fell tremendously in, in, in the ports and then it picked up aggressively, but it, through coordination with the local truckers, with the very good infrastructure of the rail, we've been able to move things along rather rather quickly compared to some of the other ports. Okay, and I'm just looking through the chat to see if there's any questions, put, put, put questions in the chat. And there is one here at the bottom, I'm seeing if I've missed any other questions in the chat. If you just ask it in the Q&A, that's better. But, uh, this one is, can you make a comment on the use of LNG for ships? Um, can I make a comment on LNG for ships? Uh, well, as an industry, it continues to be something that several companies are looking for. Um, ours, as a strategy, we have a, a strategy by 2050 to, to have reduced our carbon footprint. Uh, tremendously, and, and that will cause alternate uses of energy and fuel. LNG is part of it on a global scale. We still understand that the supply of the LNG continues to be probably the most important part of that equation and where you can uh, get the LNG. And I, I think it, it'll be one of the solutions over the course of the next 20 years for, for much of the industry. Those would be the, the general comments I could make on that. Okay, and this is, uh, here's another, one last question here. Let me see what it says from Robert Barcelo. Given current lack of space and equipment in all trade lanes, most experts see this trend to continue well into 2022. Oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not at the top of the question here. As such, from your perspective, do you see the trend to go longer? I think we're talking about supply chain stuff. If so, could this be the onset for a move towards deconsolidation by ocean carriers? Any chance of a deconsolidation by ocean carriers? I'm not sure I answered that question, uh, asked that question exactly right, but I hope I did. Dave? Um, that, that is a good question. From my vantage point, I, I do think that consolidation will potentially continue more than deconsolidation at this point. Um, I do believe that the disruption in the supply chain will continue uh, throughout the rest of this year. And, and potentially into next year. 
uh, based upon what you said earlier, and I'll, I'll focus on it again, the consumer demand will continue to, to push trade and people are spending their money on themselves and their houses and the and on things rather than experiences, which is what what drove a lot of that spending in the past. And that's a big shift. Having lots of friends in the hospitality industry, they are seeing a, a huge impact on that, yeah. not only in, in leisure travel, but in business travel again. So um, th those things will drive it. I think that uh, carriers will uh, look to, to continue to have more partnerships throughout the globe um, and, and sharing equipment and sharing um, any available space that they have in, in certain trades in order to serve the end customer. But I, I, I think the M&A activity might continue as well, Robert, um, just because it's, it's, a, it's a time where, when co companies will be able to do that. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your, your comments, your answering the questions that were had. I'm going to uh, now uh, jump to Leandro. And we'll go we'll switch from the ocean side to the to the air side. Um, thank you, Ken. Yep. And if we have time at the end, we might bring you back on if there's additional questions. But thank you so much, Joe. Um, sure. So uh, Leandro Morera is our next speaker. Um, and he is a uh, he's more than 20 years of most of you know him. He has more than 20 years of experience in the transportation sector. You might have known him from American Airlines, where he was for a number of years in their uh, cargo area here in Miami. He also was at Brinks for a number of years. Uh, he's a frequent speaker at global industry conferences uh, sponsored by organizations such as IATA and TIACO and TIACA and the U.S. Department of Commerce and so forth. Um, and he also serves as chairman of the uh, Health Technologies Distribution Alliance. I realize I'm a little bit away over my screen here, but I'm going to ask Leandro to come on uh, screen with me now, and we will uh, jump to uh, questions with uh, Leandro. So, Leandro, welcome to the presentation this morning. Thank you for being here, um, and happy birthday. Uh, Leandro had a birthday just uh, yesterday or the day before? Yesterday? Uh, the day before. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. So he turned uh, 39 once again, as I think is the correct. Yeah, answer. exactly. You got that exactly right. So, um, so let's start with uh, the same way I did with uh, Jose or Joe, and that is tell us about uh, your way, the company, what you guys do, how you do it, um, and so forth. Uh, again, Ken, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. I think this is going to be now the fourth time that uh, we are together on Trade Connections. Uh, your way is a biopharma services company uh, integrated uh, it's a we provide integrated services uh, to the uh, clinical trials industry uh, last year during the pandemic I think uh, the general consumer heard a lot about clinical trials uh, learned uh, heard also learned a lot about logistics uh, we focus exactly on every study before drugs go into commercialization so everything that touches a patient that is participating on a clinical study, uh, we are behind that. We do a lot of, uh, of the behind the scenes work. And uh, that involves like uh, procuring uh, competitor drugs that are part being used on a clinical trial, all the ancillary supplies, and also doing all the blinding so the patients know, don't know what they're taking. So there is no bias behind. And of course, do the whole project management and um, we do like last year during the pandemic a challenge was especially during lockdown how can patients still receive treatment when they cannot go to a hospital they cannot go to a clinic so a lot of the logistics last year involved bringing the hospital experience to the patient's home and that's a lot of what we did last year and we, we are still doing it uh, there is a shift on the clinical trial space where most of the trials are being decentralized and we're playing a, clin a critical role on that space where not only we're bringing medical care to the patients' homes, we're doing all the regulatory compliance and everything that goes behind. Yeah, and I should have mentioned that uh, Leandro, who's experienced largely while, while he was here with Brinks and with American Airlines, uh, his experience was more uh, regional, Latin America and so forth, but now he has a global role. And I think uh, my understanding is you're, you're looking to expand your role to the entire solar system, I think, is that right? Yes, uh, actually later on we are going to talk about when you ask me, uh, I think uh, we're going to talk about technology and I yes. think we'll be, we'll be touching on space, uh, space uh, flying and all that. Yes. Yeah, so so, that, so that, that's a good lead in. So when we talked last uh, in preparation for this, we talked a little bit about technology 
and I started thinking about it because you mentioned AI and you mentioned um, um, uh, uh, AI and you mentioned 5G as two technologies. But then I started thinking about it. I think there's blockchain, there's nanotechnology, there's 3D printing, uh, there's crypto. There's all these things that um, have the potential to be massively disruptive, not only in trade, but throughout, the, throughout our lives and our economies. So how do you see that affecting what you do in, what, uh, in air cargo space and trade in general? I think in general, uh, with better technology and with 5G, for instance, and also with IoT, you're going to see a lot more uh, data being exchanged, but better data that it's like uh, you have a lot more uh, intelligent information and also a lot of uh, f the transfer of technology, uh, the transfer of uh, information is going to happen a lot faster, which allows uh, organizations to make more accurate decisions, uh, better decisions as well. Also, I think I, we're going to see a lot in uh, machine, uh, machine learning and AI. I think that's really changing. And of course, uh, all the regulations that will come behind to support this new uh, environment. And last year, I think we all experienced, we were forced into this uh, mixed environment where we had to combine the virtual experience with the physical experience. And I think this is here to stay. Uh, technology continues to evolve and we, are learning to use new technologies. We're learning how to take advantage from them. And it's just going to continue. I think it's, a, it's really, we're at that point of no return where we're going to benefit from amazing technologies that are being introduced. And I'm quite confident that at the end of this decade, we're going to be, we're going to feel like we're in the Jetsons. And I might be dating myself here, but I think that's, that's what's coming. Yeah, the, uh, I, I was just saying something on the news about there's a company that is promising going public and promising they will have air taxis by i think next year or the year after that and so that is the, that's the ultimate jetsons experience is the air yeah and you see uh you see uh united airlines recently announced investments on vertical takeoff and landings right uh we're seeing like uh, the big rush through uh space travel right i think uh all those things combined we're going to we are in for like a an amazing uh, futuristic experience in the years to come, right? Yeah, and then the thing we talked about the other day that I think is potentially also disruptive is they now have, uh, you know, they have 3D printing that can print apparel. And historically, yep. or, for, or for the last 50 whatever years, apparel is one uh, segment that has moved around the world quite a bit. It was, we made a lot of apparel in this country, we made it in the Northeast at the very start of this country, it moved to the South. At some point, then it moved offshore. It was in the Caribbean. It was in Mexico. It moved mm -hmm. to Asia. It moved to China. It moved from China to uh, Bang, Pakistan, and Vietnam, and et cetera, et cetera. It, it really moves around. But if you've got, and it, and it lifted people in those countries out of poverty as it did so. And if yeah. you got, machinery, yeah. if you got machinery that means you can make your own apparel, it changes everything. Yeah, I see a shift into like more consumer-centric practices. Uh, you mentioned that printing, 3D printing of apparel. So imagine if you're at home, you go into a website, you're able to, through uh, AI, uh, have uh, your body completely measured with like accuracy, and then you can print your own shirts, and you can choose the color, you can choose the style. That is coming, and it's... Uh, Amazing it's, stuff. It really yep. So yep. Let's, let's go now to, to South Florida, and let's say I put you in charge of developing economic opportunities and trade for South Florida. Um, what are you going to do? Well, the first thing I will do is like, I think uh, we have uh, tremendous organizations in South Florida who do a fantastic job in their areas. And that goes, uh, I would start with uh, Miami airport. And I, see, I say this with great confidence. Uh, in the last 25 days, I've been to several airports in Europe, in Latin, Amer in Latin America, and also in the US. Uh, Miami airport is one of the best airports in the US. And I go beyond to say that Miami airport is one of the airport best airports globally. If you see how Miami has evolved, uh, more flying, more connectivity, and a specific and very focused initiatives in some areas like pharmaceuticals. So I think uh, make an inventory of all the talent, all the infrastructure we have here locally. I think that will be number one, right? Then really think futuristic, uh, futuristically. Uh, we have space travel. I think uh, very few people are thinking like, where are going to be the spaceports, right? Florida is an ideal environment to host that, right? Can you imagine you go to Miami to fly and you go to Homestead to hop on a space travel ship, right? Uh, on a rocket, right? That's one. And one 
area that I've been always very passionate about is pharmaceuticals. Uh, since uh, 2015, when we la launched the Miami Pharma Hub, I've been really emphasizing how Miami has the perfect environment to bring manufacturing here, right? And I think we are now closer to that. There's a great opportunity, and I think we should really focus on bringing pharmaceuticals here. Huh? One thing that always strikes me is that we rushed to promote the region to attract, um, to bring Amazon to South Florida, right? And again, you heard me say the other day, e-commerce is cyclical. Diseases are not, right? We're always going to need pharmaceuticals. And the, pain, the jobs in that industry, they're high, they're high paying jobs, which increases disposable income in the local, the kind of disposable income that is gonna be available in the local economy. Right. And I think I think we're seeing now, and we've seen for the last year and a half, how in, how quickly we can move on a health threat, and how quickly we need to move on a health threat. And um, Miami's connectivity, as you said, um, look, there's other airports who go to a lot of places as well. But Miami has great connectivity to many, many airport, uh, other airports around the world and around the country, and uh, and it has a rich history in the pharmaceutical industry. There's been quite a number of companies that have been started in this community um, in the pharmaceutical space. So there is a tradition. Yeah. And I'm always looking at like a, a business. Uh, I have a, a term that I coined that supplies my purpose. It's like long-term needs, right? Uh, adaptability to changes in the market. Um, the sustainability, like how can we evolve as needs change, right? And of course, marketability and profitability, right? And we have here financial services. We have here like a great uh, transportation hub. We have a great trade community. We have a great real estate space and development, both on the commercial and industrial, uh, commercial and residential, right? And come on, I think uh, we're seeing a change that if you have the option to be in a city like Miami, it's very hard to say no, right? Uh, great place to be, a lot, a lot of good things happening. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a question here from Juan Viardo. Uh, bringing pharmaceuticals to South Florida makes a great uh, makes a great deal of sense. Would qualified labor be available? That's a great question. I think there is qualified labor labor here. We have uh, great institutions like uh, University of Miami Sylvester. You have Baptist Health. You have uh, uh, FIU, who has also been making great progress uh, in that space, right? And again, uh, I think attracting labor here from states where we have seen, a, uh, we already seen an influx of uh, uh, new people moving to Florida. And I think with the right programs in place, the right incentives to bring companies here, I think it will be, uh, will be, uh, won't be that challenging to bring talent here to the local uh, economy. But, but it, does take, um, it does take uh, leaders in the community to, to champion the cause. And, and Leandro has been part of an important effort uh, centered around MIA to make Miami sort of a pharma hub. And, um, and that really it really does, Ken. We have the example of uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, where you saw like uh, several decades ago, uh, they put in place a, a series of incentives and that really made the difference. That made sense for the pharmaceutical industry to move there. And we know that today, uh, the connectivity that Puerto Rico used to have uh, decades ago, it's no longer in place, right? So I think uh, we do have now the kind of, infra of infrastructure, not only distribution, but I think uh, Miami is really becoming like, a, I would say, a, a global player. It has always been a global player, but I think uh, that uh, position is really solidifying more. And you have like a lot of diversity, uh, not only uh, in the population, but also on the options, like areas where people can work, where people can reside based on their preferences. So we have a lot going on, and I think we need to celebrate that, and we need to talk more about those uh, uh, strengths that we have. So that's why one of the first things I said is, we really need to make an inventory of everything that is here, right. and have a coordinated effort to promote all that. Yeah, and we have scripts up in Jupiter, which is yep. very well known, and, um, and there's a great push here in, in South Florida, particularly in Miami, uh, on the tech space. Well, the tech space, there's going to be some overlap there, no, on the pharma space. So there really is some opportunities for Miami in that regard. A lot of opportunities because uh, especially now with personalized medicine 
yeah. you see that we went from like, let's say door to door to vein to vein, where medicine is being developed for a specific patient based on, their, on his or her specific condition, right? And you need a lot of technology to support that, both on the uh, data uh, science aspect, but overall with compliance, with track and trace, with the overall visibility of trials. So I think uh, tech, we, now we cannot see uh, pharmaceutical or any kind of production really without taking into consideration technology. Yeah, I know we're still a week or two away maybe from uh, Pfizer and some of the others getting uh, emergency, uh, for getting FDA approval, but mm -hmm. the, the speed with which they got to emergency youth authorization is absolutely a result of the available technology that existed that allowed them to, and, and, and perhaps your way plays a part in all that, obviously, because that's what your way does. Yeah, as we, I we imagine did. if we had to wait two to three years for a vaccine, where we'd be, we'd still be a year and a half away from a vaccine. I would say even more uh, traditionally, like when you go from phase one to phase four to commercialization, it takes several years, sometimes 10 years or more, right? And uh, not only the effort, the coordinated effort to uh, push through because uh, with a pandemic, you really have to find the result uh, as quickly as possible to help you save lives. But uh, technology play played a big role, as you can imagine, uh, the regulatory requirements and the amount of information that it's uh, managed doing a clinical study is tremendous. And there are a lot of technicalities, for instance, a pharmaceutical company cannot have access to the data, cannot see who is the patient participating. So there is completely no influence to the outcomes, right? And right. then you also have uh, so many data points that you have to collect. And now with the uses of, uh, uh, you're not only looking at what happens after the patient takes the medication, but how patient behavior will influence the outcome of a trial, right? And you can only really do that with like a combination of uh, highly skilled professionals and also technology. Yeah, no, I, I like to uh, say to my now adult children that, you know, we can, we, can, we can focus on all the bad things out there, but the pace of change and the pace with which we're solving all the problems in the world is so fast right now. It's really, I tell them they're living in the greatest time in world history and they're gonna see so many changes that are, you know, so global, global warming an issue, right? Big problem. Mm -hmm. We got fires, we got hurricanes, we got extreme heat, we got extreme cold, but we're gonna figure that out. We're going to figure that out, and in, in, in these communicable diseases that are that are spreading, the, the variants are going to be fast and furious on this COVID. We know that, but yeah. I guarantee we'll we'll be we'll be up to the challenge. We'll figure this stuff out. And it's with companies yeah. like your way that steps in the way, steps in the into the breach, and, and does some of the hard work. So it's, it's really terrific. Yeah, and you mentioned speed again, and I, I'm sure that everybody's seeing like how. Uh, everybody has the needs for decisions and for solutions to happen uh, faster and with more accuracy, right? Uh, we do in general, in general have this uh, mentality of like, let's get things resolved now, especially if it's uh, uh, like a pandemic obviously has uh, uh, the needs for Im immediacy. But uh, we are seeing like with speed and um, like in the aviation sector, again, uh, supersonic flying is about to be reintroduced. Uh, there are promises to have uh, uh, for people to be able to get into any cities globally in three to four hours at a very low, uh, uh, very reasonable prices, right? So with uh, re distances and speed, distances being reduced and speed being increased, uh, that really opens like uh, so many opportunities in so many sectors. Yeah. Well, Andrew, I want to thank you for your time today. We've, uh, we've used up all our time uh, that we've had. And um, I... I I can't um, stop today without, again, thanking our uh, sponsor, uh, MIA, my International Airport, uh, for supporting this event and supporting the next one we'll have in, I believe it's in, uh, must be in October, I guess, maybe November, but we'll, we'll get information to you on that. Uh, thanks again to the World Trade Center in Miami, and remember they have their uh, 24th Annual America's Food and Beverage Show in November, and go to americasfoodandbeverage.com for more information, and the Florida Custom Brokers and Fortis Association. We will, give, we will send you a link to the recording uh, within a couple hours, I think, as soon as it goes up on YouTube. But thank you, everybody, for being here today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Bye now.